Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Foster, the interim director of the Wilton Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome you all to this very exciting presentation, Women of Wilton, Wow. March is Women's History Month, and to commemorate the achievements and contributions to history by Wilton women, the Wilton Historical Society uh, is hosting our museum educator, Catherine Lipper, and Wilton Congregational Church and Hillside Cemetery Executive Administrator, Pam Brown, um, who have done some extensive research on some very unique individuals connected to Wilton's past. Wilton Historical is excited to partner with Pam and Hillside Cemetery, which is Wilton's largest historic cemetery. And there is a wonderful walking tour of that cemetery that Pam will actually give you some more information about at the end of the presentation. Just before I pass it off to Catherine and Pam, uh, I'd like to remind everyone to please stay muted during the presentation. There will be a moderated Q&A at the end, so we ask that you simply type your questions into the chat function on your screen. Uh, so at the end, Catherine and Pam can address them uh, as fully and um, with every uh, all the information you'd ever want to know at the end. Um, so without further ado, Catherine and Pam, can take it away. Thank you. Born in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, to parents of German and Norwegian descent, Ellen Evangeline Hovick, renamed June Havoc, was an accomplished actress, dancer, writer, and stage director whose prolific career spanned the 19 teens through the early part of the 21st century. She is she is best known in Wilton for her efforts in the revitalization of the Cannon Crossing Complex in the Cannondale Historic District of Wilton and for her passion for promoting animal welfare. June and her sister, Rose Louise Hovick, renamed Gypsy Rose Lee, got early starts in vaudeville theater during the second decade of the 1900s after their parents divorced and they needed to supplement the family's income. Throughout much of her life, Havoc's career was devoted to Broadway and Hollywood, although she did play a television role in the soap opera General Hospital in 1990 and appeared in several television interviews in American Masters 1997 and an episode of Great Performances, 1999. Among Havoc's best known theatrical accomplishments were co-starring with Bobby Clark in Cole Porter's musical Mexican Hayride, for which she received a Donaldson Award for Best Performance by an actress in a supporting role, and shown here her part in a 1944 performance of Sadie Thompson, which was originally intended for Ethel Merman. Havoc's best remembered Hollywood role was that of a Jewish secretary who hid her identity in the Oscar winning film, Gentleman's Agreement. Havoc married three times. Her first marriage at age 16 was to vaudeville performer, Bobby Reed in 1928. In 1936, she married Donald S. Gibbs, an advertising agent, and her third marriage in 1948 to, tell, to radio and television director and producer William Spear is shown in this slide. That was an apparent success and lasted until Spear's death in 1973. In an interview referenced in her Wilton Bulletin obituary of April 1st, 2010, Havoc describes herself as a loner and a wanderer. I really can't point to myself as being very avant-garde, she is quoted as saying about her personal life. Havoc was already involved in philanthropical pursuits in Connecticut when she came to Wilton in 1978. In 1971, she had won a humanitarian award from Bridgeport University. She chose as her place of residence in Wilton, this circa 1900 mill house adjacent to the Norwalk River at 30 Cannon Road, located at the north end of the Cannon Crossing complex. The building, the historic name of which is Gregory Gristmill, survives today. It is a picturesque wood shingle post and beam structure with a gable roof. In December of 1978, Havoc purchased the train depot and surrounding buildings belonging to the eight acre site of Cannon Crossing 
in the Candale Historic District of Wilton for $230,000. Shortly after the purchase, she embarked on a revitalization of the properties, moving existing buildings to the complex and converting the whole into an upscale boutique destination. Quite memorably, Havoc bought the Hurlbut Street Schoolhouse 1872 from the town for $1 in December of 1979 and moved it to the corner of Olmstead Hill Road and Danbury Road to Cannon Crossing. The move itself was accompanied by a high school band led parade. After it was moved, the building was restored and converted into the old schoolhouse cafe, which you may know today as the schoolhouse restaurant. During the 1980s, Havoc held blessing of the animals ceremonies in December at Cannon Crossing. Christmas carols were sung followed by the presentation of animals specially groomed and trimmed for the festivities. On at least one occasion, a small gathering of celebrities attended along with Havoc, including Jane Powell and Dickie Moore, Robert Vaughn, and Kiera DeLay. In 1989, Havoc sold Cannon Crossing. She resided in Stamford during the final years of her life and died on March 28th of 2010 from unspecified causes at the age of 97. Moving on to you, Pam. Okay. Let's have our slide, there we go. This is Elizabeth Neufer, journalist. Elizabeth was an award-winning correspondent for the Boston Globe who covered some of the most complex international stories in places such as Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Afghanistan, and Iraq. She specialized in covering war crimes and human rights abuses. She died in a car accident while covering the Iraq war. Her driver had been racing to get her home safely before nightfall and the dangers of ambush, snipers, and kidnapping. She was 46 years old. Next slide. Elizabeth was born in Massachusetts and raised in Wilton. She and her family lived on Skunk Lane in a charming home built by famed architect Nelson Breed. She attended Cornell and got her master's degree in political philosophy from the London School of Economics. Next slide. Elizabeth worked as deputy press secretary in Washington for Senator Christopher Dodd, then freelanced for the New York Times and Time Magazine before joining the Globe in 1998. Here at her memorial service in Wilton, Peter Canelos, her longtime partner, said Elizabeth believed that foreign reporting was a way to express her deepest values. She understood chaos and crisis and kept her bearings. Where others might be shy or self-protective, Elizabeth knew exactly how to connect with people. Some foreign correspondents carry treats such as candy bars to gain favor with the locals Elizabeth always brought boxes and boxes of pens. She would look the children in the eye and say, this is the greatest weapon of all and you must learn to use it. Next slide. Elizabeth won several awards, including a Courage and Journalism Prize from the International Women's Media Foundation. Judges noted that Neufer had been menaced by gun-toting rebels, subjected to death threats, abducted by soldiers, robbed and threatened with physical harm. After receiving the award, she wrote the book, The Key to My Neighbor's House, Seeking Justice in Bosnia and Rwanda, which was published in 2001. A reviewer for Newsday called it an extraordinary and deeply moving book about the search for reconciliation and justice in the aftermath of war. The IWMF Elizabeth Neufer Fellowship is named for her. It provides training opportunities for young women journalists to enhance their understanding and reporting skills of human rights and social justice issues. Next slide. Elizabeth 
was far more than an outstanding journalist. She wanted to make the world a better place, said Globe foreign editor James F. Smith. Here's a memorial plaque honoring Elizabeth at the National War Correspondence Memorial in Maryland. Next slide. At the time of her death, Elizabeth was in Iraq reporting on the country's continuing efforts to rid itself of the influence of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. Elizabeth is buried alongside her mother, father, and a brother at Hillside Cemetery. Okay. Next, we are on to Hannah Chichester. Hannah Ogden Chichester was the wife of Henry Chichester, town clerk from 1880 until 1891 and 1896 until his death in 1911. During the time that Hannah was Henry's widow, she assumed the position of town clerk between 1921 and 1925. The Chichester family held the town clerk position for a good part of 60 years, spanning 1880 to 1940. Continuing the female line, Hannah's daughter-in-law, Helen Chichester, served as clerk from 1926 after Hannah left the position until 1940. And um, sorry, I don't have any pictures of any of them. The clerkship for Hannah and Helen would have been similar to the job of town clerk today. The primary responsibilities were managing land records, issuing licenses such as those for dogs, marriages, hunting and fishing, and serving as the registrar of vital statistics. And I have pictures of documents. These are land documents from the town hall which bear Hannah Chichester's signature and Helen Chichester's signature. The prominent Chichester family has its roots in abolitionist activity in Connecticut. Henry Chichester's father, Aaron Chichester, was a leading citizen in his day and active in the anti-slavery efforts in Wilton. A house built by the Chichesters, shown here at 2 Pimpawag Road, may have been a station on the Underground Railroad in Wilton. The dwelling remains today and is home to MG, NNG Equities LLC. Its original date of construction is circa 1800. The five bay central chimney dwelling and post and beam construction was rebuilt in 1880 in a picturesque vernacular style. The property is included in a phase one historic resources inventory completed for the town in 1989. However, Hannah, the, the Chichesters owned the house, but Hannah never lived specifically at this house. Both Hannah and her daughter-in-law, Helen, did live in a house built for the Chichesters in 1877, shown here. This dwelling remained in the Chichesters ownership until 1941. It is a yellow Italianate wood frame house named the Chichester House, located at 237 Danbury Road across from the town hall. The residents housed the town clerk's office on the ground floor for many years. Today, it is home to the Blue Star Bazaar, a women's supported apparel business. Uh, the property is also included in the historic resources inventory completed in 1989. Hannah Chichester and Henry Chichester are buried at Hillside Cemetery in Wilton, their gravesite shown here. Okay. okay. Yep, we have Angeline Post, who is an educator. Miss Post, or Angie to her friends, was a beloved teacher from 1903 to 1948. She lived on Grumman Hill, and Washington Post Drive was named after her father. And isn't that a great name, Washington Post? Um, so it is probable that her home was right in that vicinity. Next slide. She taught at the Hurlbut Schoolhouse from 1918 to 1935. Back then, Miss Post was just about the most important person in town. When Wilton was a tiny farm community with winding dirt roads 
and where kids walk to the one room schoolhouse. Miss Post once wrote about looking forward to the day with her wonderful students while traveling up and down the steep hills from her home on Grumman Hill to the schoolhouse by horse, taxi, bicycle, and eventually by car. A former student recalled Miss Post being a kind and patient woman with a wonderful sense of humor and who never used a dunce cap. That's, that's good. <laughs> In those early years, Miss Post could handle as many as 30 children at once. And as was customary for one room schoolhouses, the little ones sat up front with the bigger ones toward the rear in ascending order. Another graduate said, the little kids would hear what was going on in the lessons of the bigger ones behind them. So they had an idea of what was coming up for them later and knowing that gave them a head start. According to Ms. Post, some of Wilton's most prominent folks attended Hurlbut Street School. Many of her students became ministers, teachers, lawyers, bank officials, and doctors. So I guess their head start in the one room schoolhouse gave them an advantage. And today the Hurlbut Street Schoolhouse is run by volunteers as an educational museum. Uh, next slide, please. In 1929, the Center Street School was opened, and by 1935, Wilton consolidated its entire educational system into the big brick school, which was served by a brand new school bus. Now, big meaning it was about eight rooms um, and uh, had two classes per room. Miss Post started teaching third grade and continued for another 13 years. The school closed in 1971 and was converted to town offices. And by 1986, it was leased to um, the uh, town green offices and stores. Uh, next slide. In 1954, the Angeline M. Post School was opened and it was a new eight room elementary school. Ms. Post was the uh, keynote speaker for the event. The post school closed in 1974, and it is now the Montessori School um, on Post Road, just off of Grumman Hill, and most likely near Miss Post's original homestead. In an article written for the Smithsonian Magazine, a former student recalls that for years, Wiltonian smiles smiled indulgently at the spectacle of Angie and her sister, also a teacher and also a maiden lady, their two heads barely visible over the dashboard of their big old black Chevrolet cruising down Route 7 at a stately 25 miles per hour while a huge line of cars stacked up behind them. Next slide. Angie Post never married. She was wedded first to her schoolhouse and then to her third graders. And she stayed in the school system as long as she possibly could. After she reluctantly took her retirement, growing white-haired and frail as the years passed, she remained a beloved figure in and around Wilton Center, always smiling and almost always remembering the names of her former students, now adults, who frequently came up to greet her. She was 95 when she died. Angeline is buried at Hillside in the Post family plot. Okay. On to Alice Merwin Eakland. Alice Merwin Eakland was a graduate of the Danbury Normal School, now West Con, a teacher at the Hurlbut School in Wilton, a Girl Scout leader and founder of Minx to Sinks, an annual rummage, rummage sale first organized by volunteers in Wilton in 1931 to benefit the Nursing Association's Well Child Program. She was also a Red Cross volunteer during World War I. In this capacity, she sent clothing and bandages to army camps abroad during the war. Alice was an active supporter of the Wilton League of Women Voters and was among the first 152 women, along with Hannah Chichester, previously discussed to vote in the 1920 presidential election on November 2nd of that year. Alice was the sister of the dairy farmer and accomplished civic leader, Timothy Merwin, 
1883 to 1975, shown here in the left portion of the photograph. Timothy was a popular personality in town and was nicknamed Timo by friends, according to Robert Russell in his 24 book, Wilton, Connecticut, Three Centuries of People, Places, and Progress. He owned a farm on land, which is now the town owned park, Merwin Meadows. Among Timothy's numerous outstanding accomplishments were acquiring school lands and buildings for the town during the 1930s and 1940s, helping to found the Wilton Play Shop and acting as chairman of the local Red Cross chapter for which his sister Alice volunteered. Alice and Timothy both were grandchildren of Holly Olmsted, 1793 to 1868, a, a Yale graduate who founded the Wilton Academy in 1818. Holly also served as vice president of the Wilton Temperance Society organized in 1829. Alice was married to Charles Oscar Eakland, 1890 to 1977, a cabinet maker and the son of Charles Eakland Sr., who was a state representative. Charles O. Jr. and his brother-in-law, Timothy, Alice's brother, were likely on good terms as would have benefited Alice. According to Robert Russell's book, they performed together in um, a community singing club in town organized in 1815. And that was also the year that uh, Tim Merwin purchased land belonging to the state of Frank Comstock, after which Charles and Alice built a house in the southern portion of that land. Charles held the distinction of World War I veteran. He and Alice donated land that is now the town green to the town of Wilton in 1923 for the construction of a World War I memorial site. A cast metal plaque remind, remains there today, mounted onto a rock on the green. Alice and Charles celebrated their 50th anniversary in 1967, the year that Alice passed away at the age of 73. It was covered in the Wilton Bulletin. The anniversary celebration included a service at St. Matthew's Episcopal Church where Alice and Charles were members. After Alice's death, Charles moved to Torrance, California where he and his second wife lived with two stepsons. Alice and Charles O. Eakland Jr. are buried together at Hillside Cemetery. Great, next up we have Gladys Marhofer, who was a friend of Alice. Um, Mrs. Marhofer is a familiar fixture in Wilton's long list of civic-minded volunteers. She was a graduate of Norwalk High School, Danbury Normal School, which is now WestCon, and taught in the Danbury School System for 10 years. Mrs. Marhofer lived in Wilton for 80 years. She married her husband, Harry, in the old St. Matthew's Church, the stone church that we just saw a photo of. Uh, they lived uh, for 65 years at um, 789 Ridgefield Road, a beautiful historic home. Next slide. That's their very pretty house up on uh, Ridgefield Road. Uh, next slide. Uh, together with Alice Eakland, she founded Minx to Sinks. And the name Minx to Sinks was coined when a volunteer at a pre-rummage sale meeting brought along a mink coat. Someone else had donated a sink and another volunteer suggested they name the sale Minx to Sinks. New Yorker cartoonist Whitney Darrow illustrated the now infamous Mrs. Minx, described as the woman who has everything. She consigns it donates it or buys it at the semi-annual Minx to Sink sale. Now, I think if we look at Mrs. Sminks, she might look a little bit like Mrs. Marhofer. And I wonder if uh, Mr. Darrow got his inspiration there. Uh, Minx to Sinks is New England's longest running tax sale and has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Family and Children's Agency. Uh, next slide, please. 
A community activist, Mrs. Marhofer founded what is today called the Nursing and Home Care of Wilton and served on many school committees. She was a member of the Drum Hill Daughters of the American Revolution, Salvation Army, Norwalk Hospital Board, and American Legion Auxiliary, and many other committees. Her husband, Harry Marhofer, was Wilton's first selectman from 1947 to 1957. He was a founding member of the Wilton Volunteer Fire Department and a charter member of the American Legion. In 1983, Mrs. Marhofer was inducted into the Hall of Volunteers sponsored by the Wilton Arts Council and Board of Selectmen to recognize her community service and to encourage others in volunteerism. Next slide. Mrs. Marhofer also founded the Town Association in 1945 to help guide development in Wilton due to an increase in population. Now in 1945, the population in Wilton was just about 5,000 people. Um, so really not that many people, but uh, she was um, helped guide development with an attention to parks, open spaces, sidewalks, parking and roadside plantings. She was also instrumental in getting the first street lights in Wilton. And I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Gladys Marhofer for her forward thinking on preserving the charm of Wilton. Gladys lived to be 93 and she and her husband are also buried at Hillside Cemetery. Holly Hurlbut Wakeman and William Wakeman lived from 1826 until 1847 at 36 Sealy Road, one of two verified Underground Railroad locations. Polly married William Wakeman in 1816. Considered Wilton's foremost abolitionist, William Wakeman was elected secretary over the Fairfield County Anti-Slavery Society in 1838. The society held its first meeting in December of that year. Officers were elected from nine different towns in Connecticut, including the Wakeman's son, Levi, 22 years old, who is appointed secretary. William Wakeman is best known in Wilton for his roles as station keeper and conductor for the Underground Railroad, arranging shelter for escaped slaves and transportation north. It is likely that Polly Wakeman helped her husband in these efforts. According to David Van Hoosier, Wilton's first history recorder, the Wakemans had a room in their residence shown here that used to house slaves. Um, he would have exchanged coded letters with other Underground Railroad conductors and apparently used a hay wagon to travel at night. Such abolitionists abolitionist activity would have been potentially dangerous to the Wakemans. According to a local resident and writer, Samuel Maine, author of a brief sketch of history of the anti-slavery cause in Fairfield County, 1882, a document shown here, which is housed at the Bridgeport Historical Society, anti-slavery activists sent into Fairfield County to spread their gospel, were considered outlaws by opponents of the cause. Maine testifies that in 1882, a certain Dr. Erasmus D. Hudson of Litchfield County, editor of a publication called the Charter Oak, um, canvassed the state by lecturing and distributing anti-slavery literature. Maine attests that their persons and property were subjected to infuriated, besotted mobocrats, the tools of whose crafts were sustained by slavery. According to Maine, these individuals were thwarted by mob violence and persecutions and burned and pelted with brick bats and missiles in what is now South Norwalk. It is likely that the Wakemans subjected themselves to that potential peril. Apart from their abolitionist efforts, the Wakemans endeavor to farm mulberry trees, a popular trend practiced abroad in France and brought to Long Island and Connecticut during the 1820s and 1830s. 
Mulberry trees were grown for the intended purpose of sericulture or the raising of silkworms. However, the New England climate proved too cold. Other Wilton mulberry farmers included Deacon Matthew Marvin, the sixth, Jeremy James, who was a miller, and David Platt. None of these people, including the Wakemans, were successful at turning a profit. The Wakemans had five children, including three daughters who are buried with them at Hillside Cemetery, Sarah, Aurelia, and Minerva, and two boys, Levi and George, laid to rest at Woodland Cemetery in Stamford and Muda Cemetery in East Haddam, Connecticut, respectfully. Okay, now we have Mary Emma Woolley, who is the president of Mount Holyoke. Mary Woolley was the president of Mount Holyoke College from 1901 to 1937. She was born in South Norwalk to Joseph Woolley, a congregational minister, and Mary Ferris Woolley, a school teacher. She attended a girls' school in Meriden until her family moved to Rhode Island where she enrolled in Providence High School. In 1980, excuse me, in 1882, she attended Wheaton Seminary in Massachusetts, graduating in 1884, and served as a faculty member there until 1890. Woolley became the first woman to attend Brown University in the fall of 1891. She received her master's degree in 1895. Next slide, please. Mary Woolley's family has deep ties to Wilton. Her great uncle, Lockwood Ferris, was a well-known builder and Wilton's first selectman from 1859 to 1865. In 1871, Lockwood Ferris built the Congregational Church Parish Hall. This structure was moved in 1952 to make way for the new addition of the church. And the original parish hall is now the Wilton Play Shop on Lover's Lane. Mary Woolley is related to founding Wilton families such as Ferris, Beers, and Keeler. Uh, next slide. Um, Mary served as an instructor and professor at Wellesley College from 1895 to 1899, teaching for and acting as chair of the Biblical History and Literature Department. During this period, she met and formed what would be a lifelong relationship of 50 years with Jeanette Augustus Marks, then a student at Wellesley. Mary Woolley accepted the position of president of Mount Holyoke College in 1900 and took office in May of 1901. She began her long and productive tenure becoming at age 38, one of America's youngest college presidents. Her inaugural address set the tone for her administration. There were no limits to what a woman with a trained mind could do, she said. The ability to master certain lines of thought is a question of the individual and not of the sex. Her achievements included hiring more faculty with advanced degrees, introducing honors work into the curriculum, expanding the graduate program, successfully raising funds for the college and easing Mount Holyoke's religious exclusiveness. Next slide. Uh, Mary Woolley served as a member of the Foreign Missions Conference of North America Educational Commission to China, and she participated in several major conferences, including the Institution of Pacific Relations. In 1932, Herbert Hoover appointed her to serve as the only woman delegate from the United States to the Conference on Reduction and Limitation of Armaments held in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, next slide, please. She, um, you can go back one. Oh, there we go, thanks. 
Uh, Mary retired as president of Mount Holyoke in 1937 after a divisive controversy over the selection of her successor. She and Jeanette moved to the Marks family home called Fleur de Lis in Westport, New York. Mary remained active organizing the Committee on the Participation of Women in Post-War Policy during World War II, joining the National Women's Party and endorsing the Equal Rights Amendment. Next slide. In 1944, Mary suffered a cerebral hemorrhage that left her partially paralyzed. Jeanette cared for her for the remainder of her days. Mary died in 1947 at the age of 84. She was buried at Hillside Cemetery in Wilton in the Ferris plot belonging to her grandparents. Jeanette Marks died 17 years later and ironically was also buried in a cemetery called Hillside. And that particular cemetery is in Westport, New York. Okay, and um, thank you. And our next slide. So we want to say thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to uh, let everybody know that we have maps and brochures available for a self-guided walking tour at Hillside. The brochures can be found at Hillside's website, which is hillsidecemeterywilton.org, or you can pick up copies at the Congregational Church. Um, this is what the, the guides look like. <laughs> um, we have a little blurb about each lady and uh, a nice map on the back. So if you have any questions, um, please contact me or Catherine and we'd be happy to assist and help you with the tour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful, ladies. Thank you so much for uh, all that fascinating information. Um, if anybody has questions, as I mentioned earlier, please um, enter them in the chat uh, below. And we can certainly ask Catherine and Pam. I'm sure they'd be happy to elaborate on um, some of the women and, and information we just discussed. Um, I actually have a question, uh, Pam and Catherine, just to for, let everybody know. Where did you guys sort of, um, how did you go about doing your your research for this? You know, what sources did you use? What you know, what was sort of the the um, uh, the, the I guess the sources for um, for all that wonderful information you just shared with us? Pam, do you want to begin? Sure, absolutely. Uh, relied heavily on Bob Russell's book um, that we really use as the Wilton Bible here. <laughs> um, did a little googling. Um, also looked in some of my old files um, uh, in the cemetery. Uh, we have a lot of old written, written files and cemetery cards with some personal annotations on those. Um, looked through some old um, uh, magazines that, I, that we referenced and other folks' websites, uh, such as Mount Holyoke and um, the uh, Hurlbut uh, Schoolhouse. So really, um, I did a lot of just hunting and gathering, if you will. For me, the process of narrowing down the information about June Havoc was um, intimidating because she did so much apart from you know, being a community member in Wilton. I tried to uh, sort of dissect what is relevant to Wilton and what she brought to the community. And um, apparently she, she did a ton in Connecticut, including that University of Bridgeport Humanitarian Award. Um, so for the others, I relied for the, uh, Helen and Hannah Chichester. I went to the town clerk's office and got hold of as many documents as I could. And Julie Hughes helped me to uh, research a little bit of what they did. And I learned that the position of town clerk was really pretty straightforward. It's similar to what it is today. Um, but what was most exciting about the Chichesters, the, the research pertaining to the Chichesters was that it, it kind of like came together that they, they were um, abolitionists. And one thing that I didn't mention, they, you know, they were kind of these super prominent people 
And uh, Henry Chichester's grandfather, Abraham Chichester, which I didn't mention in my talk, was the first physician to, to come to Wilton in 1893. Uh, I, I, I believe it was 1783. Um, yeah, Abraham Chichester was the town's first physician. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, Julie Hughes at the Wilton History Room was incredibly helpful in, in researching all of the women. Thank you for that. We actually, we have a comment here from um, Lori who says that Gladys and Alice were a large part of her childhood and she has fond memories of them both. Um, uh, she also remembers Miss Post and where she lived on Grumman Hill and also notes that the Marhoffers actually lived in a different house on Richfield Road uh, when she knew them. And thanks you for the wonderful program. And, and Lori, thank you for that comment. It's sort of a, a great reminder that um, history can be much more recent than we, than we even realize. It's not always, uh, people centuries ago, it's people who have impact on history, even 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 to people today. So thank you, Lori, I appreciate that. Um, I actually have another uh, question for, for Catherine and, and Pam. Um, how did you settle on on these particular ladies? I know sort of the, the common through line seemed to be they were buried in Hillside Cemetery, but was there was there more thought put into that about sort of looking for women from different backgrounds or these just sort of popped up as people you, uh, women you already knew who had interesting stories to tell? Pam, do you want to start? Yeah, I will. Um, last year was the first year that I, I did um, a walking tour at uh, Hillside Cemetery uh, honoring um, uh, Women's History Month. And I, I, we called that, that tour Champions of Change. And we, we focused on um, the suffragist movement and women that made uh, notable changes, um, activism changes in Wilton. And this year when um, Hillside partnered with the Historical Dis Society, we thought we would touch on um, a wider um, swath of women buried here in um, um, Hillside, accepting uh, June Havoc, whose ashes are sprinkled over her beloved uh, um, Cannondale um, area. Um, and we really wanted to touch on women that made an impact um, locally um, and globally and um, internationally. So we, we really picked um, just a, a sprinkling of some of um, the interesting ladies that are, have impacted Wilton. Um, there are so many more. We, we could do this tour for years and years. We have a lot, of, lot more educators, entrepreneurs, politicians, military women, so we're hoping to really expand this um, celebration of Women's History Month um, in years to come. Um, okay, I guess I want to answer the question now. Um, I, I wanted to pick someone who is a little bit more current and, and that people may have met and uh, had involvements with, which is where I came to June. Um, I, I, I like the fact that, um, you know, she's pretty much all 20th century and she was a lot of fun to research. Uh, in, ter in terms of the others, the, um, it, it seems to be that it was probably easier to make a difference as a woman uh, in, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, if you were connected through your family to the community. So I, I think, whereas, the, you know, there wasn't a ton of information on Hannah Chichester, there was quite a bit on her husband, Henry, and the clerkship and, uh, and their family and its impact. Uh, and the same goes for Alice Eakland, because she was uh, Tim Timothy Merwin's sister. And Timothy Merwin was, a, a, you know, apparently this big personality. So she benefited from being his sister. So it, it just, I, I kind of delved into the history of various women and discovered along the way that it was much easier if they came from prominent Wilton families to talk, you know, to, to really get substantial um, contributions from them. 
So yeah, I, I did learn that it was kind of hard to stand out as a woman, even if you had individual accomplishments, if you weren't known in the community as such and such person's you know, spouse or sister or what have you. Thank you for that. And um, we, we have a comment from uh, Eileen who says, uh, I love the presentation. Thank you so much. It was great to learn about these amazing women and also appreciate the added history of structures and land in Wilton. And I, I think we can all concur that you brought some great well-rounded information. So thank you, both of you so much for your, your wonderful presentation. Um, unless there's any other questions, I think we can um, end this here. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and um, staying, uh, um, so, and uh, sorry, I can't talk today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And as always, thank you for joining us for all of our Wilton historical uh, programs. Um, please check out our website, wiltonhistorical.org for um, programs coming into the future. And um, if you guys have any questions that you think of um, in the future that you didn't get a chance to ask here, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can see Catherine and Pam's email there. Um, and if you have any other questions about Wilton history in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Historical Society. And um, thank you so much. This is a wonderful cap off to, to Women's History Month uh, in the month of March. And we hope to see you all soon. So. Take care. And uh, this recording will also be on our website, um, hopefully uh, later this week. Um, so if you want to share it with someone who didn't get a chance to see it, um, you can always check out our website later, wiltonhistorical.org, uh, where this will be up. So thank you all. Enjoy your, have a wonderful afternoon and uh, hope to see you soon. Take care. <laughs>